Hello everyone, I'm Norman Wabiger, and we're talking about sociology and pure mathematics, going back to the 19th century, looking at some of the developments in geometry there. Today I want to talk about the emergence of higher dimensions. Um, in the 19th century, people started to think about dimensions bigger than three, and I want to explain a little bit why, some of the motivation, and this actually leads to all kinds of interesting um, new developments. So Euclid's elements of course, based starting with two-dimensional planar geometry, but in the later books he does move up to 3D geometry, although that, um, that treatment of 3D is much weaker, I think we can fairly say, than the two-dimensional version, and correspondingly has seen a lot less development. So already from the Euclidean point of view, we see that there is a big jump from 2D to 3D. It's not so easy at all to bridge that. In fact, even now, most students of uh, mathematics undergraduate level, their understanding of three-dimensional geometry is pretty thin. Most of what they do know comes from linear algebra. Okay, so in the 19th century, however, we saw all kinds of movement in those directions. Amongst many things, we can talk about the emergence of Riemannian geometry, associated with the idea of a manifold and higher dimensions. We can talk about Grassmann's linear exterior algebra, a very innovative approach to what ultimately became linear algebra. Uh, Ludwig Schleifli's investigation of regular polytopes going beyond the five platonic solids. He started looking at corresponding objects in higher dimensions. He discovered, for example, that there were six regular polytopes in four dimensions. Three of them are analogs of the three in three dimensions, but there are three new ones which are quite interesting. And then we come to a whole range of um, sort of new developments centered around uh, Felix Klein and Sophus Lee having to do with Lie groups, homogeneous spaces, groups of symmetries uh, interacting with, uh, with uh, a geometry. So there's much more here, but we, I want to be able to try to say a little bit about these things still in a very general way for a non-technical audience. You're a sociologist, you just want to understand you know, what's going on with geometry and this, this evolution into 20th century geometry where suddenly geometry really uh, falls off, uh, off the cliff. So why is that? One important source of motivation for higher dimensional geometry comes from physics. In looking at phase spaces for dynamical systems. So this is work that perhaps goes back to Joseph Louis Lagrange, who was Europe's foremost mathematician after Euler passed away. And he did very important work on dynamics, reconfiguring Newton's laws of motion and framing them in a kind of variational way. In fact, his approach is still really at the heart of a lot of modern physics. So just to give you an orientation there. So if we just think about a particle moving in the plane, okay, so here's a particle, the xy plane. So we can describe the position at any time with a pair of numbers. Of course, this particle is also having a velocity. So it's not entirely described by the position. The velocity is also required. The trajectory of the particle is then uh, some path in the plane. But if we just are given the path, then we can't so easily reconstruct the motion because we don't know where the particle was at a given time. So to incorporate that, we could go up in dimension and introduce a new third dimension for time. Then we could record the positions x, y of the particle, but also the time t at which it was actually at some point. So at that point there, it might have been up, you know, it might have been there at time t equals three quarters. So then we could record that by putting a dot there. And then the two-dimensional trajectory then becomes a three-dimensional trajectory, sort of like some kind of helix that sits on top of this two-dimensional curve in this three-dimensional space with the new dimension being time. Now, going up a little bit from that is uh, the idea of um, describing both the position and the velocity uh, separately. Okay, so the position here is given by two coordinates. The velocity vector at this point is also given 
with two coordinates. The velocity has an x and a y component. So the velocity could be described in the velocity plane, if you like, and the position in the position plane. And then the total um, information about the point rate when it's there is described by the combination of the position and the velocity. All right, so this is the phase space description of uh, a particle, and we see that this is a four-dimensional story. The particle is moving in two dimensions, but when you include the two velocity dimensions, you get a total of four. Okay, So this is the way physics generates higher dimensional spaces by looking at particles just in our ordinary, uh, say, three or two-dimensional space. We generate uh, more complicated things in higher dimensions. Again, this is a very powerful and uh, common approach that physicists use. So while I'm doing this, I want to also touch base with some of the ideas that I've already introduced. And one very important such idea is the idea of projective space. So uh, let's talk a little bit more about uh, how projective geometry naturally leads us to think in higher dimensions. So we talked about the projective line last time, and we saw that one way of thinking about that was as the space of lines through the origin in two-dimensional space. And there's the origin, and we look at all the space of all lines through that point, and that's really the projective line. Now if we think, say, of moving through that space, so let's start with the x-axis like this, and let's start rotating the line, okay? So once we get to a quarter of a turn, okay, well we can just keep on going. Once we get to a half turn, we see that actually we're back where we started, okay? In the sense that the line that we started with is now the same line that we've gotten through a half turn. Because we're talking about lines and not rays. If we were talking about rays, you know, one side of things, then yes, we would be in a, in a different position. But if we're talking about lines, we're actually in the same position. And that means that as we're going from here to here, we're actually going through a full turn. We're coming right back to where we started. So topologically, in terms of the overall shape of this space of lines, we're really getting a circle. So the projective line is, we say topologically, in terms of its shape, it's a circle. If we go to one higher dimension, look at the projective plane now, okay? So that's like the usual plane together with some additional points at infinity. That can be described, as the 19th century people realized, by looking at lines through the origin in three dimensions. So again, we're going up one dimension to understand the projective geometry. So in ordinary three-dimensional space, let's say that's the origin right there, okay? And so we're looking at all lines through the origin. That's essentially a two-dimensional space. And you can think about it intersecting a plane. Let's say there's a viewing plane up here, then most of the lines through this origin will meet this viewing plane in, in one point. But there will be a few that don't, and that's, that's exactly the horizontal uh, lines. And there is a um, sort of a, a one-dimensional family of them. In fact, they form exactly a projective line. Now, there's another way of thinking about this projective plane, once we've identified this idea of lines in three-dimensional space, is to realize that if we take a sphere for a second and allow the sphere to help us visualizing projective, the projective plane, we think of the center of the sphere as being the origin, so the lines that we're considering are lines that are passing through the center of that sphere. So any such line will emerge from the sphere in two opposite points, like maybe a North Pole and the South Pole, or maybe, uh, let's put this straight, uh, maybe uh, Sydney down here, okay? And the opposite point, which would be roughly about there, the, uh, that point is a little bit uh, in the North Atlantic, uh, somewhere off of um, uh, Newfoundland. So any line through the center is going to meet in this pair of antipodal points. And so that means that if we wanted to sort of visualize um, or sort of realize, you know, graphically this projective plane, one way to do it would be to forget about the lines and just look at pairs of antipodal points on a sphere. And then we could say, well, actually, you know, um, 
if we have pairs of opposite points, then one of them is always going to be in the north, northern hemisphere. So if we take the equator and sort of chop off the southern hemisphere, then every um, one of these pairs of opposite points is going to have a representative in this northern hemisphere. With the exception that, uh, so here's the northern hemisphere, that the points on the equator are still going to have to sort of be identified. So if, you, if we chop off the lower southern hemisphere, we still have the equator. So p opposite points on the equator still have to be sort of glued together in this model, okay, to form this projective plane. And actually people can do this if you make a, a globe like this or a northern hemisphere out of wool or something. You can even attempt to then start sort of sewing a, a point on the equator here with the opposite point and then this one over here with the opposite point on that side and so on. So you end up having to sort of twist your uh, your your wool to do this. So this point A has to be sewn there and this point B has to be sewn there and this point C has to be sewn there. And it turns out that you can't actually quite finish this. You can go part of the way but you start seeing that the surface that you end up creating is, is sort of knotted and doesn't actually live properly in three dimensions. Okay? It's an interesting discovery that people made that, that topologically this projective plane is actually quite complicated in that it cannot be actually exactly realized in three dimensions. But if we go to higher dimensions, then we can realize it as a legitimate surface, quite smooth without any irregularities or foldings. So that's another reason why higher dimensions are, are interesting, because sometimes certain shapes that naturally appear, configuration spaces, uh, don't manifest themselves so easily in lower dimensions. There's not enough room, but in higher dimensions there is more room and we can actually then somehow make models or consider models of them. And the projective plane is a really uh, good such example. So if we go one step further in this discussion of these projective spaces, and we, starting with the projective line, which is one-dimensional, then the projective plane, which is two-dimensional, the next thing is the projective space, which is three-dimensional. So we could think about that as sort of like a regular three-dimensional coordinate space together with some points at infinity. And the points at infinity that are required, well, we need a point at infinity for every direction of a line in three-dimensional space. So there's a point at infinity for, for this direction, another point of infinity for this direction, etc. So the, the points at infinity that we have to add to the regular three-dimensional space are really just like a copy of P2, like the lines through the origin in 3-space, which is what we said was P2. It's a sort of funny, it's northern hemisphere with this funny kind of gluing along the equator. Now that's hard to visualize, and, and the 19th century people realized that, okay, we could do the same thing that we we're doing before and try to understand this projective space, P3, as lines through the origin in four dimensions. So here's yet another reason for thinking about higher dimensions. The projective space, the three-dimensional projective space, really requires a, an ambient four-dimensional space to create it in a nice uniform way. Here's some kind of visualization of it. It's, uh, something analogous to this, except I have an x-coordinate, a y-coordinate, a z-coordinate, and now a w-coordinate. Okay, so, so for example, this four-tuple, one, two, three, minus one, would represent a point, to this one here, obtained by going one in the x-direction, two in the y-direction, three in the z-direction, and minus one in the w-direction. So if we put all of those together, one in the x direction, then two in the y direction, like this, that's like that, okay, and then three in the z direction, and then we have to go minus one in the w direction, so there. Okay. So this point is the point, it's a, it's a two-dimensional picture of a four-dimensional object, okay, it's the point one, two, three, minus one, and that point then, if we join it to the origin, we get a line in this four-dimensional space whose homogeneous coordinates, in the same spirit as I talked about in my last lecture, will be this proportion 1 to 2 to 3 to minus 1. 
in the sense that if you scale up or down and multiply all these entries by five, you're getting another point on the line, getting really the, essentially the same line. Okay, so uh, that's a little bit complicated, I, I agree, um, but you can see that the four dimensions is required. And interestingly, in modern graphical applications, like video game design, or CGI construction of animated movies, or various uh, graphics, or even uh, industrial applications in, involving um, you know, robotics and such, it turns out that a, a projective point of view is often easier. So instead of describing things like positions with a, a single point with three coordinates, sometimes it's easier to use these homogeneous coordinates and add a fourth coordinate and then allow yourself some scaling variability. So you're really working in the projective space. And this has the advantage that then points at infinity are included, so it's more aligned with uh, changing perspective. You change perspective, your viewer, whatever is moving around, uh, then the way the scene transforms is uh, more easily captured with this, um, this application of four-dimensional uh, sort of projective geometry. Okay, so this is actually quite useful. Okay, and we see again that just to understand our three-dimensional space, it's, it's nice to think about four dimensions. As another application of these ideas and, and seeing how working in some lower dimensional space can naturally lead us to want to think about higher dimensional spaces, let's go back to the planar situation of circles in just two dimensions. And I want to talk about a very interesting approach to circles initiated in the 19th century called cyclography. And this is a way of describing circles in terms of their centers and their radii. So here's a circle centered at the point 2, comma 1, 2, 1. And if you go over 3 in the x direction, you get to the point 5, 1. So this is a circle centered here through the point 5, 1. Its radius is 3. So it can be described by the triple 2, 1, 3, and therefore then denoted by actually a point in three-dimensional space. Now, an aspect that's interesting here and, and pleasant here is that this allows us actually to get at a, a more subtle feature of circles, namely their orientation, because we can also consider a circle centered at 2, 1 with a radius of minus 3. Okay? Now, what would that mean? I mean, is it the same circle? Well, it looks like the same circle, but it's to be regarded as the same circle with the opposite orientation. So if this radius number is positive, then we'll agree that the interpretation is that we're talking about an oriented circle, one where you specify a, a, a direction to go around, in this case, the positive or counterclockwise direction. And if the radius was negative, so if we reflected this down here, uh, down here, uh, we would get the point 2, 1, minus 3. That point down here would denote the same circle, but with the opposite negative orientation, the clockwise orientation. Uh, this is actually very useful uh, when you're talking about um, uh, tangency of circles. And it's actually quite useful in uh, industrial applications when you have cogs and, and, you know, this cog is moving like this and there's another cog here and sort of intermeshing. And so this one's going in this direction, this one's going in this direction. You, and the, the, the or relative orientations is important. So this is actually uh, quite useful uh, there. So it's an example of um, a situation where we're, we're taking a two-dimensional situation and somehow looking at it in this bigger three-dimensional situation. Okay, and it gives us um, some, some more power. In fact, I wrote a paper with cyclography uh, just last year with a former student, uh, William Baer, okay, on the Feuerbach theorem, which is a famous theorem involving circles and triangle geometry. And we showed how the classical cyclography um, allows us to, to see some aspects of this in, in a new and better light. So it actually has direct applications to triangle geometry. You, you can look up that paper if you like. So here's another really good example of how we really are led to higher dimensional spaces, even if we're just interested in the geometry of the world around us, this three-dimensional geometry in which we live.
So if you're taking a, a first year linear algebra course at a university or college, you know, you'll learn about these coordinates and you'll learn that, okay, points are described by triples A, B, C, and planes in three dimensions are described by linear equations like this, AX plus BY plus CZ equals D. And here this equation is only determined up to a scalar. So if we multiply everything by a factor, well, the, the actual plane doesn't change, even though the equation looks like it's changing. So instead of having really four degrees of freedom here, like you might at first think, there's really only three degrees of freedom, which is telling us that the, the space of planes in three dimensions is really a three-dimensional space. Actually, another nice way of thinking about that is with respect to a conic. If we go back to Apollonius, okay, so here's a, here's a, a, a three-dimensional version of, a, of a, a conic, which is a quadric. So it's a sphere, but that's just an example of, of a quadric, a quadratic surface. And if you have a point here, okay, this is very parallel to what I was talking about the last time. If you have a point here, you could look at the tangents to the sphere from this point. So that would be like a cone, a cone that sort of sweeps out here, right, like, like this. A cone. Okay. Now that cone um, will meet the sphere in, in a circle, I, ca I called it a green circle last time, and that determines a, a plane. Okay. So we have a correspondence starting with the point to a plane. And the closer the point gets to the sphere, the closer the plane gets to being the tangent. So this is a kind of a correspondence. It's, in fact, it's exactly a three-dimensional analog of this pole-polar correspondence that I have already told you about in the planar situation for conics, so it happens in three dimensions too. And it gives you then a correspondence between points in three-dimensional space and planes in three-dimensional space. That's another way of seeing that the space of planes is three-dimensional because there's a three-dimensional sort of space of points, and so there's going to be a three-dimensional space of lines because the points and the lines are in correspondence, starting with a, a fixed quadric like a sphere. Now, that's all very well, but there's something in between points and planes in three dimensions, okay? A point is zero dimensional, a plane is two dimensional. The thing that's in between them is a line. So it's a natural question, okay? What about the space of lines in three dimensions? What does that look like? So that kind of question has, uh, has uh, different aspects. So the simple aspect, so the first thing that you want to identify is what is the dimension of this space? You know, the space of lines, is it three-dimensional, four-dimensional, 17-dimensional, whatever. And then the second natural question, a more sophisticated question is what does this space look like sort of globally? So the dimension is kind of a local thing, you know, sort of like uh, you know, how many degrees of freedom are there near a typical point in your space. But the global structure is, is more complicated and, and it might involve this kind of wrapping around or, or, or folding around that we saw like in the projective plane. Okay. So let's stick with the simpler question and just ask, what is the dimension of the space of lines in the plane? Well, it, I know a lot of you have not taken uh, linear algebra, but that's fine. Um, so very quickly, in, in linear algebra, when you're dealing with lines in three dimensions, there's basically two ways of approaching it. One is a, kind of a parametric vector form where you start with a point, A, B, C, you have a vector R, S, T, and you say, okay, we're starting at this point and we're going a multiple um, of, of this vector from the point, okay? So that's a, a, a sort of parametric vector form for a line. Now, if we set this equal to X, Y, Z, say, so that's our generic point, then it's not too hard to sort of massage this to, to get what's sometimes called a Cartesian equation for the line. And so you like, if you take a sort of solve for lambda in, in each of the variables, if you solve for lambda in the first variable, a plus lambda r equals x, so that means lambda is equal to uh, x minus a over r. And then solve for lambda in the second one, you get y minus b over s, and the third one, uh, z minus c over t. So you get this equation, this is like the Cartesian equation of a line. But it's not really a, an equation, is it? It's really a pair of equations, say this equals this and this equals this. We're writing it as one equation, but it really has two separate um, equations there. 
So that's a more subtle thing. And to complicate matters, um, you know, this equation is highly non-unique, just like this one is highly non-unique. So describing lines really effectively, um, to be honest, is, is not done with either of these technologies. Neither of these technologies is really a very effective way of describing lines in three dimensions. Okay? So at some point I should tell you more about the right way of doing that. It's actually quite involved and was worked out by Plucker, uh, again, one of our 19th century heroes. But one of the things he realized is that this space of lines, however you're going to describe it, is essentially four-dimensional. The space of lines in three-dimensional space is a four-dimensional object. Now here's a simple kind of way of thinking about that. So suppose I have a line okay, in three-dimensional space. Okay, it goes up that way, it goes up. If I, if I just sort of extend it down, it'll meet the floor at a point. There's a point. And if I go up there, it'll meet the ceiling of this room in another point. So I get two points, one on the floor, one on the ceiling. And no matter which pair of points I choose, one on the floor and one on the ceiling, if I join them up, I'm going to get a line. Now, do I get every line this way? Well, not quite. I get most lines because you just choose a line at random. Yeah, it's going to meet the, the floor and the ceiling. But if I just choose a line which is exactly horizontal, okay, then it's going to miss the floor and it's going to miss the ceiling. So there's a kind of a, you know, a family of, of these horizontal lines. There's quite a lot of them, but um, it turns out that's sort of a lower dimensional family. So the, the generic line is determined by a point in the on the floor and the ceiling, and that's two degrees of freedom for the floor and two degrees of freedom for the ceiling altogether four degrees of freedom, telling us that the space of lines is four-dimensional. So that's a, sort of the easy uh, question. A uh, more sophisticated question is, um, what's the nature of this four-dimensional space? You know, what does it actually look like? Can we make a model of it? Um, and in what space can we exhibit such a model? You see, this is a... Uh, this is really a, a very fundamental question. Okay, we're talking about the world in which we live in. We're talking about lines in the world in which we live in. Okay, which play a crucial role. And we want to have a good way of understanding, representing these lines, and working with them. This is not very exotic. Okay, but just this very simple question already leads us to some quite sophisticated geometry, necessarily involving higher dimensions. Now I'm covering a lot of material here. I realize. But I hope that even if you are not mathematically very trained, that you are still getting an understanding of things. And I want you to have this idea that you know, ultimately math is not really that, that complicated. I mean, yes, sure, it gets really technical, but sort of the essential questions, or a lot of the essential questions, are, are kind of simple ones or natural ones. Okay? Even though, you know, in answering those questions, we can end up going down lots of rabbit holes and it can get quite technical. Okay, but overall, I want you to have the idea that yeah, we're talking about pretty natural things and these are reasonable questions that it's quite decent for us to, to think about. So I'm going to finish the, uh, the lecture here by talking about um, quadratic curves in the plane, like conics, ellipses, parabolas, hyperbolas. By asking the question, what does the space of quadratic curves look like? And in particular, what is the dimension of that space? So we're talking about equations in x and y, which are at most quadratic. So, you know, you can have an x squared or an xy or a y squared, but nothing higher than that. So these are the only kinds of terms that can happen. You can have a linear term multiple of x and multiple of y. These are the linear terms, degree 1. And then here are the three quadratic terms, multiple of x squared, multiple of xy, and multiple of y squared. And then we set that all equal to 0. And that's going to be sort of the generic equation for an ellipse, a parabola, a hyperbola, or maybe a product of lines, maybe even a double line, okay. maybe even actually a point. So that's the generic equation for such a curve. So we might ask, okay, what is the dimension of all of this? Well, the dimension, you can think about it as being the number of parameters, but sort of independent parameters. So, how many parameters are there? One, two, three, four, five, six parameters. But I'm subtracting one. Why am I subtracting one? 
for the same reason that uh, we talked about earlier, that this equation is not actually unique because we can multiply that equation by any non-zero scalar, like three, we can multiply everything by three, and we're going to get another equation of the same underlying curve. Okay, so there's a, a kind of a redundancy here. So we have to subtract one. There's really only five independent parameters floating around. That means the space of conics, or more precisely quadratic curves, in the plane is five-dimensional. Now this five um, figures actually quite prominently. It figures um, in the logo for GeoGebra. So GeoGebra is a dynamic geometry package, um, which is very nice. And here is the logo is something like this. There's these five sort of dots connected with uh, uh, lips. Okay. And this is a reflection of this, uh, this theorem that five points um, determine a, uh, an ellipse, or in, in, in general, a conic section. And here's an, another manifestation of this. Suppose that you have um, five lines. Let's make them parallel lines just for simplicity. And suppose I choose a, a point on each of the lines. Okay, point, 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 point. There's then a five-dimensional space of such configurations. And here's another, that's another way of thinking about getting a five-dimensional you know, space of stuff. One dimension, two dimensions, three dimensions, four, five-dimensional space of points on each of these five lines. And it's a theorem that, you know, given any uh, five points in the plane, um, pretty more or less, um, there is a unique conic that passes through them. Okay? And so that's a, a kind of a way of, of thinking about um, a reflection of this fact, that, that the, the five-dimensional aspect of the space of conics is being reflected by the five degrees of freedom that you're allowed to, to move these, these, these slide these things around, and you're still always able to generate a essentially unique conic. If all of this stuff interests you, you might like to think about, say, cubics in the plane. How many degrees of freedom involved in that? What's the space of cubics look like? Um, and then you can even think about, you know, in, in, in higher dimensions, if we have a three-dimensional thing and we're looking at a surface in X, Y, and Z, and we look at, say, quadratic surfaces, those are called quadrics, um, what's the, the dimension of the space of quadrics in three-dimensional space? So even if we restrict ourselves to just three-dimensional space, we see that there's plenty of opportunity for bumping up against higher dimensional things. And this was one of the great um, discoveries of the 19th century and generated all kinds of um, interesting developments. And I'll tell you about some more of them in my next video. I'm Norman Wahlberger. Thanks for listening.